accelerating their development. You can see the crisis in the ruling class, you know, and you can see the growing ferment amongst the masses. So we are living in what the old Chinese philosophers used to call interesting times. Yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, one of the great discussions that is uh, floating around and has been for some time, but particularly now is who's the boss? You know, the, the tail wagging uh, the dog, et cetera, right? Um, and I like to think of it like this. The separating, you can only separate the tail from the dog using language, using words. It's all one dog. You know what I mean? We cut that dog up using words. We can call it, well, he has, the dog has a tail. It has a paw. It has ear. No, it's a dog. The tail, the, the nature of a dog is ears and tails and paws. Only language can cut that dog up and allow, if you cut the dog up, he's going to be dead. So, but, so we use language and then we pretend as though cutting the dog up with language is not metaphorical, right? I'll throw that out there and then go to you. I could keep going, but you know, this is about hearing what you have to say. Um, what is Israel's place in the empire? Is the tail wagging the metaphorical dog? Is it just a an imperial military outpost? Israel's place in the empire. There's no just about it, I think, Garland. I mean, I, I quite like your, your, your metaphor there, but let's think about this two ways. On the one hand, you're absolutely right. Um, Israel, if, if we think of Israel as the tail of the dog, it's an integral part of US imperialism, US imperialism being the whole dog, right? Uh, the tail is a very important part of a dog, as anyone who has a dog will tell you, and uh, why it's so cruel to lop the tail off a dog, right? Because the dog's never quite the same afterwards, okay? Well, you can think of that, that definitely that analogy works. Um, let's think about it another way. The tail doesn't wag the dog in the sense of, you know, the initial impulse that gets the tail going comes from the dog's brain, right? Comes through the dog's brain and then send signals to the brain and, and then the tail does what it needs to do, right? And I think that's important, you know? So when we talk about the tail wagging the dog, we're talking about that, we're saying, oh my gosh, this relationship has, has gone upside down. And now instead of the boss, you know, dictating to the, to the colony, the colony seems to be in charge of, of the empire. How did that happen? Um, I think there's a fundamental misconception about what the Israel lobby is. And partly that's because of its name. Sounds like it's something foreign because people don't understand actually what is Israel, that it's a settler colony entirely dependent on imperialist sponsorship, right? It doesn't have a self-sufficient economy. It can only keep its state of uh, uh, its living standards and its uh, military level as it is because of the huge subsidies it gets from the imperialist heartlands. Um, and the reason they give it those uh, subsidies is because for them, it's not charity. It's a very, very good, important investment, right? If we look a bit closer at APAC, which is the kind of body in America that everybody, it's kind of notorious. What's it? American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, right? So again, it's got Israel in the title, but you have to, at the beginning, it's American, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And it's notorious for the fact that it seems to have got control of every politician in US public life, right? And so people go from that and say, oh, Israel controls our politics. American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Just remember that if you look a bit closer, APAC is not funded by Israel, it's funded by owners of big capital within the USA, hedge funds, you know, big capitalists in the USA pay for the business of the Israel lobby. They pay for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. These same donors, they're also donating to organizations which promote Zionism ideologically, religiously. They promote colonial settlement. They subsidize the building of new settlements in Israel, right? All of this is not a charity, it's an investment. And if you look at the donors, a lot of them are big companies and it's hard to see who's behind all of that, but American Jews may be prominent 
in that list of donorship, but they're not exclusively the donors, right? Um, I think um, it was Norman Finkelstein made the point that the Jews were the most successful ethnic grouping inside the USA. And therefore, it's not surprising that uh, there are prominent number of Jews, a disproportionate number of Jews amongst the US's ruling oligarch, oligarchy. But that doesn't mean that it's because they're Jews they fund Israel. They, they discovered their Jewishness in uh, as they discovered the use of the Holocaust industry in promoting and giving a cover for Israel uh, when the USA started to take over control of Israel from the British uh, in the 50s and 60s. So, you know, you know the kind of activities that APAC gets up to. It's not the only one. APAC and other groups within this kind of lobby organized tours of Israel for politicians, academics, and media personalities in the US in particular, so they can shape their perceptions about what Israel is, so they can persuade them to see uh, the Palestinians and the wider Arab world through a hostile, kind of Israel-centric uh, lens, right? And mm -hmm. politicians and media in the USA have all learned that they're going to get well rewarded for going with the flow on this issue, for going with the Israel lobby, for going with the Zionist narrative, and they're going to get destroyed if they don't. So there's a carrot and a stick, right? You get good rewards, nice trips, pats on the back, plaud, it's a nice career, everything goes well for you if you go along with this narrative, if you try to stand up with it, they will be ruthless in crushing you. And we see also that the, the same donors, they're also funding politicians directly, right? And that's that's one of the things that lots of critics look at and say, look, this every single politician in the Senate you look at has, has and the Congress has uh, funding every time they're up for election from some kind of uh, Israel lobby group, right? Um, they've got groups like the Zionist Organization of America. They've got Christians United for Israel. All these groups are trying to shape US public opinion. They're trying to create this large body of ideologically driven public support for this settler colonial project and make it look like it's just kind of it's just natural to like Israel and be a friend of Israel and support Zionism. And it's kind of shocking not to. Um, and there's a plethora of dedicated think tanks as well. A, a couple I came across were Foundation for Defense of Democracies, oh, yeah. Heritage, Heritage Foundation. American Enterprise Institute, they've got all these names. Their job is to provide experts yeah, and talking points on Israel and Iran to shape the media narrative. So you can see this, this many tentacled monster, the Israel lobby. But the fundamental point to understand is that a pro-Israel donor in the USA is not the same as an Israeli. A pro-Israel donor in the USA is someone who understands the vital uh, nature uh, the, or the vital uh, importance of Israel to US imperialism. And I think if you look at Israel itself, the leaders of Israel understand their role, they understand their relationship. As much as they try to pretend they're independent, when it really comes down to it, I mean, just look at the, the attack you referred to last night. If it was indeed that that, that was the, uh, the response to Iran, that's because Israel got orders from the USA, keep it low key or else. And ultimately, when the USA gives an order and means it, the Israelis have to jump. You know, the public discourse in Israel has to be one of independence. Why? Because to keep the foot soldiers motivated, which is the whole Israeli population, right? They are imperialist foot soldiers in the Middle East. To keep them motivated, the Zionist brainwashing, uh, has and the narrative that says we're the chosen people and you know we're here to do to to set up God's you know special place on earth or whatever for for the Jews to be safe in um, that's an important weapon in keeping those people motivated to be the soldiers for U.S. imperialism in the Middle East right so they have to have this public discourse but the leadership know perfectly well that the USA is in charge um, and just like the Banderites in Ukraine right um, they know. They're servants of the USA. They're not fighters for Israeli or Ukrainian sovereignty, right? I mean, you know, in the case of Ukraine, sovereignty is a thing that once existed, but they lost it 
um, finally, the last bit of their sovereignty they lost in 2014 with the Maidan coup. In the case of Israel, there's never been such a thing as Israeli sovereignty. It's always been a settler colonial project, first for Britain and then for the USA. You know, the, the British governor of Palestine, uh, Ronald Storrs, um, described the Zionist project. Um, and he said that its purpose was forming for England a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism. So stop and think about that. This was a this was something that the British had done before. <laughs> Why did he call it a Jewish Ulster? Because they used a plantation of a loyal population that got privileges in Ireland in order to control uh, the, the local population. And that's the basis for the still ongoing problems in the north of Ireland today, this settler population that for a long time was a supremacist population with a privileged uh, position. Uh, that's what the Good Friday Agreement was meant to bring to an end. Um, so what we have to really understand, I think, is that ultimately the money that funds Israel and the money that funds the Israel lobby comes from US-based monopoly capital. And I think if you if you want to take a kind of step back and see well, why would they do that? I hear a lot of people asking this question, Garland. Why? What kind of an ally is Israel to us? What do we get out of funding Israel? And I think this question stems from a kind of a fundamental lack of understanding of how imperialism works. People think the state is for all of us. Yeah. And like, well, I'm paying taxes. Why do I? But all I see is I'm paying money and I get nothing back, you know. You're right. You pay for the ruling class to spend and they spend in ways which make sense to them. You know, if you look at Israel, uh, I think it is to the USA today what India was to Britain 150 years ago. Right. It's the jewel in the crown of the empire and its loss would be the beginning of the end of US imperial domination of the globe. Right. If you look at what's happened since the USA took over control of Israel, the Jewishness of US businessmen became useful to them, where before it was something they really played down. Normal, Norman Finkelstein talked about how when he was young, nobody was talking about the Holocaust right, right after the war. It was only in the 60s it was like discovered and turned into an ideology and an industry as a cloak for the US takeover of uh, the Zionist project. And you know, Norman Finkelstein had a lovely uh, sentence. He said, the USA is the corporate headquarters of the Holocaust industry. So this industry, again, it sort of looks as if Israel pushes it, but actually it's not. It's the USA which pushes this ideology that there is one Holocaust with a capital T and a capital H, right? The Holocaust, and you must never compare other Holocausts with the Holocaust, because there's a kind of unique suffering there. And that all also plays into the Zionist narrative of, of chosen special. You're a special victim and a specially superior type of person. That's what sort of Zionism tells Jewish people and uh, Jewish people in Israel in particular. Um, but, you know, the, the Holocaust industry ultimately is a weapon to back up Zionist supremacism and to cast any critic of Zionist philosophy and Israeli supremacism as an anti-Semite. You know, and this whole machinery I've just been kind of talking about has been constructed right layer by layer by layer since the 1960s to bolster the position of Israel as an unofficial colony in this decolonizing world, right? To ensure the USA's continuing control of Israel and therefore its continuing control of Middle Eastern oil and its domination of Middle Eastern peoples. And I think right now what we're seeing is the disintegration uh, really of that machinery. Thank you.